want to say about last week, this is going to, you should never do this. If you ever are talking to a church, you should never apologize, is what they say in the books. Never apologize uh, when you start a preach. And there's reasons for that. But I want to apologize for last week. Last week, I took way too long to say way too little. And I shouldn't have taken that long. I should have put more time in preparation. I know everyone's going to be so nice to me. No. <laughs> grace, grace. Yes, 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 yes. But the reason I want, I, I want to apologize not to get fake sympathy, although it's so nice. Thank you. Not real sympathy. Uh, because, you know, we are responsible for what God gives us. And we want to do good things in our responsibilities. And when you mess up, and I know last week wasn't a car crash, and no one, no one went home thinking, oh, who's Sean, and why did he take so long? But I could feel in the moment, as a, as a new preacher, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm learning. That's, that's not an excuse, it's just an explanation. I could feel, I'm losing people. I'm taking a little too long. I'm a little clumsy. I'm tired myself. And uh, I just try to cram too many scriptures in, and I try to do too much. And so the reason I'm apologizing is not because I want you to be nice to me. It's because I want you to see... It's okay to apologize. Look in the mirror and see how nice you were to me. That's why it's good to apologize. Because it gets things off your conscience. And it takes the pressure off you to perform and do everything perfectly. It's okay to make mistakes. Now, in some worlds, that's not okay. If you're in a high-level business and you lose a million dollars because if you didn't make the phone call or send the email, you're going to get fired probably. But between you and your father, he loves you. And he's gracious towards you. And God will never fire you. No matter what you do, God will never fire you. In fact, he, he changed your v, very DNA from, I think it's called um, dead, to alive the moment you get saved. And so he's not going to go and kill you again. His purpose is to save you and make you alive. And so just because you make mistakes, and lo and behold, even on purpose doesn't mean you just lose your salvation automatically and now you're cast into hell because you did the wrong thing. Because you preached too long or looked at the wrong thing or said the wrong thing. That's not the way that the kingdom works. The kingdom is based on God's grace and God's forgiveness. And whilst you were still dead in your sins and transgressions, God made you alive with Christ. So when you make a mistake, when you do something wrong, when you mess up, when you preach a little too long, it's okay to go, God still loves me. And simultaneously go, I messed up. See, people who think that God's going to punish them for making a mistake, don't admit to his mistakes. Because you don't want to deal with the punishment. When you know that Jesus dealt with the punishment on your behalf, it's very easy to apologize. Morning. Morning, guys. How are you? I'm putting all the attention on you. <laughs> Because you're late and how dare you? No. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I'm very naughty. I know, I know. Can you see the heart that I'm saying that? I'm not saying that to ease my conscience, although it does. Thank you for that opportunity. I'm saying that so that you feel free to live your life as a son and a daughter of God. To, free to make mistakes. But also free to improve and try and learn and grow. So this week, <laughs> so this week, I put more effort into exactly that thing, making it more concise. I wanted to give 18 scriptures again today, and I'm only going to do 17. <laughs> and sometimes I, I'm giving you the context that I'm talking to you in, but you all have your own context. Sometimes I approach a preach and go, we'll figure out the title afterwards. And this week, I tried my best. I don't know if I didn't succeed, but I tried to figure out my title beforehand. Why? A little bit of frame, a little bit of boundary, and give it some more structure so that we can get to the point quicker. Is that okay? When you go to your boss and your boss says to do something, put some effort in. Put a frame around it. Think about it. When you send the email to the client... Don't give them the answer that they asked for. Give them the answer they asked for, and then answer their next question. <laughs> Don't just do what's required of you. Don't come to church and preach a sermon. Don't answer the email that has been sent to you. Don't just do what's required. 
go above and beyond. And in that same way, you will learn, you will develop, you will grow, and you will become more productive in your life. So we've got these two extremes in the religious, let me just say this, in the Christian world, not the religious world. On one extreme, we've got the religious that want to behave perfectly and do everything right and never make any mistakes. And then it's all about them and what they can produce. On the other extreme, which is what we would fall into potentially if we, if we were going to error, which would be God's grace, God's love. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to try. I don't have to put any effort. God's going to accept me anyway. All true. Absolutely true. But you'll produce very little on the planet as a partner with God. If you just go, grace, 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 grace. And we love grace and we preach grace and we're going to preach grace again today. But if you just settle and never learn and grow and try to improve and try to help the customer the best you can and serve your boss even though he's grumpy, then there'll be no, very little production in this life. And so don't be religious and just live by the law and doing everything perfectly. Otherwise, God is, God's going to strike you down. And neither live on this extreme where just anything goes and you can do nothing and flop around. There's actually a healthy balance where you go, God loves me and accepts me. As Rob says, if I sat in a dark room and ate hamburgers all day long, God still loves me and accepts me. But you know what? I get an opportunity for these brief 70, 80, 90 years on this planet to partner with God and produce an abundance through my life. It doesn't negate or degrade grace. It elevates grace, not just to you, but through you. So the next time you have a failure, don't beat yourself up and don't be afraid. Apologize, repent if you need to. Do whatever you need to do to make it right with other people. And then go, but I'm going to get my teeth stuck into the next one. I'm going to do better with the next client. My next child, right off the oldest child, the next child is going <laughs> to... I'm the oldest child, so that's what mom did to me. With God's grace, every situation is redeemable. Don't just write it off and go, I'm giving up. Either because you're religious and you think there's so much judgment, you just block your eyes and never have anything to do with the big guy. Or because you're just so wishy-washy, you're never going to try anything because also you also don't want to fail and look like an idiot. Understand that grace encourages us to receive a greater abundance so we can produce more. You don't have to produce more. You get to produce more in this life. Amen. Bow your heads and pray. No. <laughs> That's the message today. And so I want to take you through some scriptures to show you, not Sean's opinion, but biblical theology so you can see how to produce more through your life. Matthew 16, verse 19. Jesus is speaking to Peter, who's just had this amazing revelation of who the Christ is. And Jesus says, nobody revealed this to you. This was not flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven revealed it to you. And he says, I'm going to establish the church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And then he says this most, this is like Lord of the Ring, Marvel comics on steroid type theology that Jesus is preaching. This is so fantastical. If you're bored with Christianity, just go and read this verse and you go, what is Jesus talking about? It'll take you into a whole other dimension. So Jesus says to Peter, Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What do keys do? They unlock. They open. They make something that previously was unavailable. They make it available for you. He says, I'm going to give you keys to unlock things that previously you didn't have access to. He says, this is what the key will do. It says, you will bind on whatever you bound on earth will be bound in heaven. I do not understand that. I've studied this for many years. I do not understand what Jesus is talking about. I can give you what people say, but by revelation, what are you going to bind on earth that's now bound in heaven? Give me an object. Give me an item. Give me a thing. Very, very hard to try and understand that. But I love, 
I love looking at these questions because on my deathbed, I'll still be pondering these things if I'm, if I'm able. Uh, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He's giving Peter power. He's giving him authority. And he's saying, I'm giving you access to things. You will have the choice to access things that previously you could not access by just yourself. Jesus had the right to give Peter those keys. He had the authority to give Peter those keys. And it was his purpose to come to earth to give not just Peter, but all of us those keys. To create an access point from heaven to earth. To take from what's available in the perfection, in the ideal of what, whatever's around God is heaven. And there is nothing missing. There's nothing broken. There's no lack. There's no poverty. There's no sickness. There's no relational issues in heaven. The second the devil popped his head up, he was thrown down like lightning. Nothing can exist in heaven that is not good. That is God's glory. That is the weight of his goodness that exists wherever he goes. And so when we have access to heaven, we have access to all the blessing and all the goodness that exists around God. Somebody lift your hands and say, Father, I want to access. I want to access. And whatever we have access to, we can then let loose into our environment, into our world. You don't have to bang on heaven's door and plead and beg and say, God, 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 please, please, please. I'm poor. God, I'm sick. Like the little old lady who went to the judge. It's a good story to talk about some aspect and some dimension of who God is. But God is not someone who has to be woken up and will bless you because you pester him. Why? <laughs> God is not someone who you have to pester and bang on his door and wake him up at 5 a.m. so that eventually he'll give you what justice requires. God is someone who's loving, who's leaning over on his front tippy toes to bless you. But this is the literal key to accessing the blessing. Jesus gives us that authority. Who wants to look a little bit greater at this key? Or one of the keys? I'm going to say something this morning that I never thought I would say in church. And it's not a swear word. <laughs> it's a three-letter word. Key, no. Uh, I'm going to... I always hated this concept because... I, I'll explain it when I get there. But I want to tell you, this is not something that I conjured up and thought about. This is not my home territory. This is something I have rejected and pushed away, complained about. But God is giving us a key this morning. And I tell you, once I saw this, and I saw this by a preacher of the name of um, Miles Monroe. I don't know much about his ministry, and I heard the message, and some of the things I just thought, that's Old Covenant. But he said some things in there that opened my world up to a whole other dimension that I hadn't seen before. And the second the key unlocked that door... I went, whoa, God, this is why there's been a limitation on my life. This is why there's a ceiling. This is why I've been struggling in this area. Because I had concepts that restricted the flow of God's grace. And so the second I saw that, I've already seen fruit start to flow because of this concept. Something I never thought I would share in a church. We'll get there. Let's look at Ephesians 1 verse 3. Praise be to, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Everyone say, has blessed us. Has blessed us. Past tense. Is God going to bless you? Yes. No. I tricked you. As Sammy says, I tricked you. God is not going to bless you. God cannot bless you because he has already blessed you. When you pray for blessing, give yourself room to use vernacular and English that we all brought up in Chinese and th that's fine but theologically God can't bless you because he has already blessed you it's a little bit like me knocking on my bank manager saying give me the money give me the money give me the money and he's saying I already put the money in your bank account I can't give you more because I've already given you everything so God has already blessed us 
Now, you may ask, why am I still sick? Why am I still poor? Why do I still have issues? Why am I still not seeing the kingdom manifest at a great degree through my life? Because the blessing is in the heavenly realms. Everyone say heavenly realms. Heavenly realms. Now, Jesus knew this when he was giving Peter the keys. Because he said, everything I'm going to give you, I'm not going to give it to you right now. I'm putting it in heaven for you. But I'm giving you a key. See, God does not give you wealth. God gives you the power to get wealth. Sometimes God won't feed you. He'll give you a seed so you can plant it, you can grow it, and you can feed your family. You can feed your community, and you can turn it into a business for the kingdom. So, so many people are missing what God's doing because they're looking for fruit, not for seed. And God will give bread to the eater, but God loves to give seed to the sower. An eater has enough for one meal. A sower has enough for the next generation. So God's mechanism for blessing you is perfect and it's holy, and it's righteous, and we don't get to complain that, God, why didn't you give me the Mercedes-Benz here? No, he's got the Mercedes-Benz for you in heaven. Better than a Mercedes-Benz. A Toyota, no. Uh, <laughs> healing, wealth, <laughs> health, peace, the ability to go to bed at night, rest your head on your pillow, and not be consumed by worry. Do you know how many, how many millionaires would trade all their money for their peace? You hear about these rich women who have fantastic jewelry and they get to the third world country and they take off all of their jewelry and hide it because they're worried their fingers will be chopped off in the street. That's not peace. Wouldn't it be wonderful to display God's wealth just openly like we can in Hong Kong? That's why I've got a lot of jewelry. Uh, Christ has blessed us. God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing. If you can name it, God's already blessed you with it. If you can conjure it up, if you can articulate it, God has already blessed you. Say, thank you, God, that you've blessed me. But it's in the, spiritual, it's in the heavenly realm. And you need access to open the door to get it. When Abraham believed, his account was credited. That means money was topped up to the maximum limit that he had with righteousness. That righteousness is an ability to receive at any point as much as he needed, more than he needed. God didn't give him gold. God gave him righteousness. And then gold just came to Abraham as he needed it. Abraham lied, which is... <laughs> I don't know how you can explain that theologically. He lied to the king and he walked out with a bunch of gold. I don't know what management book, what leadership book, what Christian self-help book would give you that advice. But that's Abraham's advice. No, it wasn't Abraham's advice. Okay. Everything's in heaven. Everything that God wants to give us, he has already given us. And he's put it in heaven in the heavenly realms. Oh, now I've got to go up to heaven. Now what do I do need to go up to heaven? Yes, you need now to shoot yourself in the head. Nope. <laughs> you need to access heaven. Let's bring up just one chapter later. Please remember that often when we're looking at scriptures and we're looking at ideas, we, we're cherry picking verses to build out an idea. Good, wholesome, nothing wrong with that. But it's also good to read the whole book, to read the whole context. Because sometimes you can read something and it's saying the exact opposite unless you read the whole thing so just turn your page to the next chapter and Paul's saying because of God's great love for us God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions it is by grace you have been saved you do not get access to the heavenly blessings outside of grace and grace, by definition, is unmerited favor. That is the lowest level definition of grace. But it is unmerited, which means you can't earn the key. You can't take hold of the key by your effort and by your striving and by you doing the right actions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us where? 
in heavenly realms. So you didn't have to earn your way up into heaven. God placed you in heaven in Christ. In the very same heavenly realms that he's blessed us. He has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing. I think that's powerful. I'm with my blessing right now. There is no separation between every blessing I could imagine and who I am. Meditate on that for a few years and then please share your revelation with me. He seated us in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Andrew Womack teaches on spirit, soul, and body. He's been teaching that for I don't know how many decades, but it is the most beautiful theology because it can explain the difference between why I can if experience lack physically, I can experience sickness in my body, and yet my spirit is perfect. And so him and many others will teach on living from the spirit, not living from the outside, from your flesh. And so it's <laughs> There's always a distinction between what we see manifest with our physical eyes and what by revelation has already manifested to our spirits. But the good news is, because Jesus has given us access to those spiritual realm, to those heavenly realms, we can manifest that perfection in heaven into our imperfect realities. Okay, next slide. In order that in the coming ages, God might show the incomparable riches of his grace. So he seated us in the highest place because he wanted to be kind to us and he wanted to show off. Isn't that beautiful? And that is expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Don't believe people who tell you that earning that key and deserving that key and beating your body to get that key is the only way that you're going to access heaven. Don't believe it. It's all nonsense. God is very kind in giving us that key. He saved us. You didn't save us. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. That's powerful. We could spend weeks just on that one word in this context. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. So here we have not talked about one thing that we've done so far. We've talked about we've been blessed by him, not by us. Grace has done that for us. And he's placed us in spiritual realms at the highest place. We are now seated in Christ. We are co-equal heirs. We did nothing so far. The only way we get access so far is faith. That's it. We get access to heaven by believing that he did it all for us. That's it. In an instant. Second you hear the revelation of the gospel. And you go, I believe, boom, saved. Perfect. Perfect work completed for all time. It's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works. Everybody say, not by works. So that no one can boast. God didn't do that just because he didn't like boasting so much. He did it because he loved you, because of God's great love for us. The consequence is we don't get to boast. There's nothing I can do to get placed in the heav heavenly realms. Nothing. I can't boast. I can receive it by faith. That's it. I just, I believe what you did. Boom. Righteous, perfect with Jesus. Everyone say amen. That should be recap. That should be nothing new to anyone in this room. We should all know. We're saved by faith. Uh, by, by, we're saved <laughs> by grace through faith, not by works. I can't boast about that. There's no boasting in what I can do. I was dead. I couldn't become better and good enough and rise to the occasion. And one day out of a thousand, maybe I'll make it. A dead man can't climb Everest on his best day. We had to be made alive so he could raise us. Nothing you did. Not by works. Watch this. Not by works. Not by works. Not by works. It keeps you humble. It keeps you worshiping. It keeps you safe and steady. It keeps you grateful, thankful for what God did. If you miss that out, you'll mess up your life. Because if you think it's all about you and what you can do, you're in trouble. Or what you can't do. Okay, stop mothering me now. <laughs> not by works, not by works, not by works, not by works. Not by works. 
This is the part I never thought I would say in church that we're about to go into. Okay? Next slide. For we are God's handiwork. He's created us. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Previous slide, you're saved not by works. God did it all. He did everything for you. Now he's created you. And then he puts you in a position of perfection in the heavenly realms. For what? For good works. See, religion has taught us you need to do good. You need to do good works. You need to avoid bad stuff. You need to do good, do good stuff. And when we approach good works from a place of not understanding that he's done all the work to save us, we get religious, we get entitled, we get boastful, we get judgmental because how dare someone else fail? Don't they know how hard I tried? We beat ourselves up when we fail. But if we come to grace, we go, God's done it all, which is true. He saved us. He's made us righteous. He's redeemed us. And then we don't read the next verse, which is now he's positioned you in the heavenly realms with all the abundant blessings that he's made available freely by a gift we don't go to do good works. We're going to miss out on the opportunity. He has positioned us for good works. Somebody say, God has positioned me for good works. Watch this. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. So he's prepared for you work to do. Before you were even born. Let's read it in another. Uh, I really like the passion. Some people really dislike the passion. I just like it because it's different. It triggers my brain differently. Read different versions. Don't get stuck on just one version. Same verse. For we have become God's poetry. A recreated people that will fulfill the destiny has given each one of us. For we are joined to Jesus. The anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. The reason you're bored, the reason you feel empty, often is not because you haven't preached enough grace. Sometimes it is. Sometimes you really need to detox from religion and come all the way to this extreme. But then if you just stay at verse 9 and not come to verse 10, which is God has given you a destiny and a purpose to live out. Not to win and earn and deserve his favor, but because you've already won his favor through Jesus. He's already pleased with you. Now he's pleased with you. Now have a go. Now learn, grow, develop, try your best, fail, get up again because you know no one's judging you. At least not from heaven. When you experience hatred from people on earth, go, well, hate me all you want. I've got someone who's bigger than you that loves me more. And I'm going to keep on attempting to do good works. Somebody say amen. amen. Meditate on that scripture. We do not do good works to earn favor. We do good works because it's our purpose and our destiny. And we're going to see that in greater detail. That I've never seen what I'm about to tell you. I've never seen this before. It's so powerful. But I want you to say, I want you to see, our good work does not earn and deserve. Our good work is from a place of Jesus earning and deserving our position in the heavenly realms. And now we access by that, that kingdom key that manifests what we've already received from Jesus into the earthly realm. Get that clear. I don't mind if I labor that. I don't mind if I bore you. Because if you ever revert back to religion that says God owes me, you're in trouble. You're going to get boastful. You're going to get proud. You're going to get judgmental. And you are going to lose out. Not good. You. That key is only accessed by faith, which is receiving what God's done. Let me remind you, we said this a few months ago. Faith does not move God. Faith does not move move God. God was moved at the cross by what his son did for us. Faith is a response to the fact that God has already moved. If you step out in faith and you think my stepping out in faith is going to attract God's attention, you've missed grace. 
Faith only works through grace. God has already moved, and his eyes are wandering to and fro through the earth. He's looking. And when you move, it's because it's a response to the fact that he's already moved. That's what faith is. Faith doesn't earn and deserve. Faith responds because you already have an account full of righteousness. Somebody say amen. Okay. That should all be recap. Everyone okay with that? Good. Yeah. Or I'm just suffering from memory loss, James. Oh, uh, Todd. <laughs> When you don't see that, Paul calls that mindset immature. Let's bring up 1 Corinthians 3. The verse before I'm qu quoting says, I wanted to give you solid food, but I have to give you milk because you're immature. He says, you're still worldly. You're still thinking on a humanistic level. There's something greater available that's from heaven that I want to impart to you, but you're still thinking with the wrong mindset. He says, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? He's saying there's fruit in your lives that shows you where you're living from. He says, are you not acting like mere humans? Well, are we not mere humans? No, we are not. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. We are not mere humans. We're not human. We're not mere human. We are human. <laughs> <laughs> some weird ideas Paul's saying you know your spiritual DNA is alive you have access to greater why are you operating by the, by the ways of the world by how mere humans act you're a son of God you're a daughter of God you have greater access why are you trying to steal your neighbor's bread when I've given you a bakery you're childish you're immature for one, when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, which is my hero, my pastor, my leader, this is my guru, and I'm going to believe what he says, because if he wins, that means I win, rather than believing you have direct access. I'm all good for quoting. I've quoted people this morning. You know that we all love Robin Glenda. I'm not talking against uh, loving leaders. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is an allegiance that goes beyond our heavenly allegiance. Because watch this, because they were, they were attributing to Paul and Apollos and Peter later on all the glory when they should have been attributing the glory to God. That's the problem. For where one says, I follow Paul, another Apollos, are you not acting like mere humans? What, after all, is Apollos? What is Paul? Can you see the humility? This is the guy that we believe. That, that the reason we believe the gospel is because this guy wrote this, this, this stuff down. If he didn't write it down, we probably wouldn't have the gospel in this form today. Because even a hundred years after the, the early church, things were already starting to get perverted and religious and dogmatic again. And because he wrote it down, there's churches today who are stepping into freedom, even though they have thousands of years of religious training on tradition, because he wrote down, I'm saved by grace through faith. And when people read that, they go, oh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power unto salvation. Martin Luther reads, oh, faith, what's this faith thing? All my religious training tells me I earn and deserve, and I got to step up the, go up the steps to the mountain and beat myself up. And then he reads that because of this man. And you know what this man says? What am I? He says, only servants. In other versions, it says only workers through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each one or each of us his task. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. Didn't they do all the work? Weren't they so great? I planted, Apollos watered but God has been making it grow. If you think growth comes from what you do, you're wrong. God has already blessed you in the heavenly realms, and all of that blessing is accessible. You don't make it grow. You just access that which he makes grow. This is going to keep you safe. When you start to produce results, that's the true test of whether someone's got good character or not. This is why. 
the young footballer, 17, gets paid a lot of money to go to the top club and score big goals. And the next year he's got a drug problem and he's got three babies and he's arrested for, for hanging out with prostitutes when he shouldn't have been and his life falls apart. Why? Because he didn't develop character. He didn't develop humility. He just had a skill set that was amazing. And that wealth ruined him. It's a very common story. It's very easy to be frugal when you have nothing because you don't have a choice. But if you've given lots of money, that's how frugal, frugal you are. Look at my bank, my bank account when I first started to earn money. You'll see. I thought I was good with money until I had money. It's like, oh, oh, this is a different game now because I could buy it and I did try, choose to buy it and I shouldn't have. And then you learn to grow. Thank God God didn't make you successful on day one. Thank God there's a process that matures you. So when you mess up, you don't mess up on a world scale. Please, never pray, God, give me the lottery. The lottery will mess you up. Go, God, give me an opportunity to learn and grow so I can sustain what you want to give me. We don't bring the growth. God is the one who brings the growth. So neither are those who plant nor the one who waters anything, but only God who makes things grow. Okay, I still haven't got to the crux, but I'm setting it up. I, know I don't want anyone to be confused about what I'm about to say. Okay, Miles Monroe, Genesis 2 verse 5. Blessing in the heavenly realm. God has done all the work to make you righteous. And anything you do on this earth does not earn and deserve the blessing. It accesses the blessing by the keys that Jesus gave us. I've read this a hundred times. I never saw this. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth. And in some version it says, because there was no one to work the ground. Now look at this. All of the potential was available on the earth. All the seeds, all the plants, all the trees, everything was available. Every blessing was created by God and there. But God didn't send the rain. Why? Because God's holding out, because God's horrible, because God wants to test you. No. Why, God, why did God not send the rain to trigger all of that potential? Why? Because no man was there to work the ground. Ephesians 2.10. We are God's poetry. We're God's handiwork to do good works that he prepared in advance for us. So here we have potential, but no result. By God's choice. What's some hindrance from the devil? God didn't send the rain because man wasn't there to work. Here's the word I never thought I would say in church. In, Miles Monroe says this, this M word. He says, because man was not there to manage the ground. Everybody say, manage. Man is the center of manage. I hate the word management, or I've, I've, I've had to repent this week. I used to hate the word management, because when I looked at a manager, what I looked at is someone who, had, who lacked the skill to do whatever job it is, but were empowered to tell others to do the job. <laughs> That's not always the case, but that was my perception. And I always felt like management was an excuse to have control over others rather than genuinely have strategic knowledge and ability and vision and then, then actually make the thing happen. So I have hated management. I've always had bad experience in my jobs. My managers have always been controlling people <laughs> and very, very difficult. And I found it restrictive and difficult. And God reprimanded me this week and said, Sean, how can I bless you with our management? If you don't work the ground that I've called you to work, which is management, you're not going to access the potential that I've already placed purposely there for you in advance. So watch this. In, in uh, the children of Israel coming into the land of promise, 
The land flowing with milk and honey. Vineyards they didn't plant. Houses they didn't grow. They're coming into all of the abundance that God has got for them. And he says, I will drive out the Canaanites. He says, but I will not drive them out until you start to possess the land. And every step that you take, I will drive out more of your enemy. And if you take another two steps, I will drive them out two steps. But if you don't possess the land, I will not drive them out. Now, who's doing the work? God. But who's doing the possession? Man. And if they don't manage their steps and decide to advance or let fear get on top of them, God will not drive out the enemy. So we don't earn and deserve God's blessing. But we don't access that potential until we learn to manage what God has already given us. We do not earn salvation by works. But we do do good works because he's already perfected who we are. Somebody say amen. It answers the question of, Lord, why am I not seeing abundance in this arena? Why is this not happening? How do I get there? And sometimes in the extreme grace camp, we go, well, God, you've got to do it all. You've got to do it all. Why haven't you done? And we've missed. I need you to step. I need to walk. I need to put your hands on something. I need to bless you in this arena. But you need to go. Because I'm not going to water where you're not. I'm not going to bless where you're not. I'm not going to drive out the enemy where you don't go. What's the point? In Genesis 2.5, that word work there is the word avad. Sounds very clever to mention a Hebrew word, but I don't know how to pronounce it. Avad. It means to serve. It could mean to worship. It means work, labor, till, or the, my favorite, cultivate. That means to make an atmosphere ready for production. It's funny that the rain came on Noah only after he had fil- finished the boat and shut the door. Boom. The second he shut the door, the rain started to fall. If Noah left the door open, no rain would have fallen. Noah didn't make it rain. And yet, when he operated in faith and closed the door, the rain came. This is why it's easy to get proud sometimes when you produce a miracle because you think you produced it. Because when you shut the door, the thing happens. Noah didn't produce that miracle. God did. He prepared Noah in advance. And then Noah obeyed by faith and saved his whole family. And the second he is obedient in faith, it happened. If you're standing as a mere human, you'll look at Noah like a god. But Noah knew he, didn't, he couldn't make rain. There was no rain. He, no matter how much rain dancing he did, to manipulate God and how much sacrificing of animals no rain would have fallen so God gave us the ground to work to manage he gave us this planet and so if you don't work it God can't bless it let's read Deuteronomy 28 this is the blessing in the and there's like about a third of a page of blessing and Two pages of curse in Deuteronomy 28. And this is part of the Old Covenant. So some of this language is Old Covenant language. But this also demonstrates the heart of God to bless you. And so if you lived under the Old Covenant perfectly, these are the blessings you would get. There was somebody who lived perfectly. I think his name begins with a J. And so because we're in Christ, we get access to all of these blessings. Not because of us but because of what he did. He raised us into the heavenly realms. So this is the heart of God for you. I want you to notice the word hands. Everybody say hands. And I want you to see what God does does to your hands. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herd and the lambs of your flock. Great detail about all of the different options of how you could be blessed. Lord, Lord, should I live here or should I live there? Well, as long as it's in the city or the country, God's going to bless you. Don't get too caught up. (laughs) If you want to go live on Mars, maybe he won't bless. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. But um, God's going to bless you. No matter what what you do, God's going to bless you. 
you have access to their blessing. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. That means when you make bread in the morning, it's going to inflate. It's going to grow. It's going to make you fat. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. Notice he didn't say no enemies will come against you. And what do you do in battle but pick up a sword? With what? And so some people at the extreme spectrum of grace, 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 grace go, well, I don't want to do anything. I'm, and I'm an advocate for rest. But I love Winnie's definition. She says, you, what do you say, Winnie? <laughs> you, you work in his peace or you rest in his peace. Rest in his peace. Rest is not an activity necessarily. It can be. But rest in his peace means even if you're doing something, you're not earning and deserving. So the promise is as you come into battle, you're not just going to sit there and do nothing. Joshua had to fight. Even though Moses was putting his hands up, Joshua still had to fight. There was no victory without Moses putting his hand up. Yes. But if it was just about Moses putting his hands up, why didn't we get everyone off the battlefield and just huddle around Moses and pray and put his hands up? No, they had to fight and they had to pray. And so resting in his peace is not inactivity. And this is what immature people will come into grace and think, well, I do nothing now. What do I do now? What do I do now? I don't want to work. I don't want to work. I don't want to work. No, there's a working for righteousness and then there's a working from righteousness. You never work for righteousness. You believe by faith. But you do work from righteousness by resting in his peace. And then when you're in that peace, you can fight all the battles you want by your own sweat, by your own energy, by your own revelation, by what you can conjure up. And you may win some and you may lose some. But if you fight in his rest, that enemy will flee before you. And I believe it says in seven different directions. Verse 8. Remember what I asked you to, to look out for. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. In other words, if you don't put your hand to it, it will not be blessed. God, why aren't you blessing? Why aren't you blessing? Why aren't you blessing? Well, you need to put your hand on it. You need to manage it. You need to work it. Then I can bless it because I'm going to bless everywhere you put your hands. When Bonnie and I were first married, it was hell on earth. It was just horrible. We were fighting. We didn't understand what was going on. We were so romantic and idealistic and had this Hollywood idea that we're just going to get married. We're going to be rosy and wonderful. And we, we had a wonderful honeymoon and we came back from honeymoon and it was just hell. It was just terrible. I'm a very strong person. Bonnie's a very strong person. And two strong people in a marriage, it's, it's difficult. It was very, very difficult. And I remember one day, I was walking down the road, weep. I was just crying like a big baby. And this is supposed to be a happy moment in my life. You know, we barely out of lit, the literal honeymoon. We're still a couple, month, couple months married. I'm saying, God, I need your hand in this situation. I need your, I'm just weeping. God, I need your hand. I need your hand. And God said to me very gently, but very strongly, he said, Sean, you're my hand in this situation. Because I wasn't willing to solve all the problems in the marriage, which is a man's responsibility, a husband's responsibility to lead that. A, woman's, a wife's responsibility to do that as well. You can't solve all the problems if a wife's not willing to, to work with you. But as the husband, God was calling me to lead. And I thought by magic it would just happen because we had a Hollywood idea. Oh, happily ever after. And then when it didn't work out the way that I thought, I essentially was blaming God. God, it's the woman you gave me. Those are the literal words I said. God, it's the woman you gave me. Unless you're work, willing to manage and work what God's giving you and has given you, there's no blessing. Oh, but Sean, that's by work. That's by work. Yes, good work. Good works. God is going to bless the work of your hand from a place of perfect righteousness. 
And so don't get stuck in a magic mentality that you wave a, a, a wand and God just produces on your behalf. Sometimes that happens. It's so wonderful to have Red Sea open and you just walk through. Better to have an armada of ships <laughs> in preparation. <laughs> it's better to be prepared. David said, the Lord has trained my arm for battle. He didn't just kill Goliath willy-nilly. He had practiced. He had done something. His hands were blessed. His hands were trained for battle. And we're so enamored with Moses on the mountaintop going, oh, well, I'm just going to lift my hands. And I love that. We preach that and we believe that. And you must do that. But what about Joshua down on the field chopping heads off? You can't just ignore that. You've got to put your shoulder to the plow. You've got to put your hands on a weapon. You've got to put your hands on the Bible sometimes. You've got to put a hand on a kid. Uh, <laughs> you've got to manage what God's given you. Because the blessing goes where your hands go. And if you don't step into the promises, God's not going to drive out the enemy before you. It's not a works mentality. It's a good works mentality. The blessing in your barns and everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you uh, an oath. If you keep the commands, the Lord God, the Lord your God, and walk in obedience to him, then all people on earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will fear you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock and the crops of your ground. In the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. So he's, he's given it. You just need to walk in what he's given you. Then he'll bless you. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouses of his bounty, and send rain. Very Genesis 2-esque. He will send rain on your land in season and to bless all the works of your hand. You will lend to many nations and borrow for none. Uh, next, uh, the Lord will make you the head, not the tail. The Lord will bless the work of your hand. If man didn't come into the garden, which was not corrupted by curse, the devil hadn't tainted Eve and Adam and brought pain and toil into the planet yet. If man in that perfection didn't see the blessing until he was there to manage it, then you and I have an invitation to go, God, give me something to manage. Show me what you've already given me to manage so I can see your blessing through my life. Don't just sit there complaining, going, but God, but God, but God, but God, where's your hand, where's your hand? No, you're his hand. And he will bless you on journey. He will bless you in your mistakes. He will bless you in your failures. But you've got to put your hands on it. Okay. Man is at the center of management. There is no management without man. Management means, there's a lot of definitions, and I'm going to try and avoid business definitions, although if you read on management, mostly applies to business. Because businesses are organizations where they collect people together to do some purpose or task. But it's not exclusive to businesses. You can manage your life. And we'll look at that in a moment, how you can manage things better so that God can bless the work of your hands. But there are four objections, uh, there are many objections. I'm just going to list four objections to management. The first objection to management is, we've already labored this this morning. It's all about my own work and what I can do, what I can boast in, and the kingdom that I can build for myself. And so if I just try hard enough and I impress people and I do all the right things, then I'm owed this and look at how great I am. Godly management has no boasting. What am I? Paul, the writer of the new covenant, essentially. Who is Paul but a servant? The first objection to management 
is either you fall into the trap or you're arrogant against that trap like me. He's like, I don't like that theology. I disagree with that. And so I don't like the word management. That's the first category. Faith is the access point to grace, not work. From that place, we then produce. The second objection is magic. We've just mentioned that. That God does it all, and I don't have to do anything. In terms of righteousness, that is the truth. But in terms of good work, that is not the truth. You need to put your hands to it. So let me give you a stupid little story. I remember hearing this at six or eight years old. A man gets stuck in a flood. He climbs to his rooftop. I'm sure you've heard it. And he hears the angel from heaven blow the trumpet and the clouds open. And he says, John, you're stuck on the rooftop. I am going to save you. This is the Lord your God. And my hand is mighty. And I'm going to bless you in this situation. I will save you. Fear not. And he feels settled and and uh, at peace, and he goes, wow, God's on my side. God's real. Thank you, God. And he went from panic to peace. Oh, wonderful. Anyway, a little while later, not even two minutes later, a speedboat comes. Pop, 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 pop. Little red speedboat comes along and says, hey, sir, you're stuck on the roof. Come and jump on our boat. We're going to save you. And John gets arrogant and says, you're not going to save me. The Lord is going to save me. And so the little boat goes on, thinks he's crazy. Got other people to save a little while later, a farmer in a big tractor with big wheels comes along and says, John, I'm surprised you're on the rooftop. I thought you were cleverer than sticking around in the flood. Come onto my tractor. I'm going to save you. I'm going to get you out of here. No, the Lord's going to save me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Little Sammy's been running around the house going, hallelujah, hallelujah. So the tractor goes off and saves other people. Eventually, the water's rising all the way to the rooftop, and his bum's getting wet as he's in the rain. And the water's just rising. He's getting very scared now because the Lord said he would save him. And a ship comes floating past and says, we're going to send a little lifeboat out to you. We're going to save you. And John says, no, the Lord's going to save me. And the boat keeps on going. The water drowns him. He gets up to heaven and dries off. And says to Jesus, Jesus, you said you were going to save me. And Jesus says, yeah, I, I did say I was going to save you. Did I not send you the little boat? Did I not send you the big tractor? Did I not send you the ship? So sometimes we get so clever that we think when God says something to us, that it's coming in a certain form and only in that form. And God often will bless you not by the means of the blank check in the envelope through the post, but often by family. That's one of the greatest blessings and the greatest curses in life is family. Sometimes it's the person closest to you. Sometimes he's not going to give you just the brilliant genius idea that's going to change the world. Sometimes God's going to bless you in your boring old job. But you know what's required? You need to put your hand on those emails. And those letters, and those boxes that you fill up, and that floor that you sweep, and that toilet bowl that you clean. And you need to pray and say, God, thank you that you bless the work of my hands. Now, I'm not waiting for some magic. It's not a miracle. Magic out there that you're going to bless me in my job. And we're waiting for the angels to come down. Some, there's very few people in the Bible who had the angels come down. Most of the time, they had to walk they had to work. They had to do boring things. And the highlights are written in the scriptures. And we go, look, look, David just fought giants. No, David did very boring things a lot of the time. We just read the highlights and go, wow, isn't that amazing? I'm just going to kill giants every day. No, sometimes you've got to sweep a floor. You think Moses was having fun in the desert looking after sheep? But that 40 years of training didn't quite prepare him, but it helped to prepare him for bringing Israel out of bondage. And we're going, God, 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 magic, 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 magic. It's wonderful when miracles happen. And we will learn how to operate in greater miracles and see greater miracles. But I want to say that there's something better than miracles. It's the blessing on the work of your hands. Do you know that you are, in terms of likeliness, in terms of chance, you're much more likely to save 10%, 20% of your funds 
every month, every week, put that into a savings fund, and at the end of your life, have much more money than winning on that lottery ticket. And that's how a lot of Christians, immature Christians live. They think that somehow some magic miracle is going to save them. And God's saying, no, I've blessed you with the breath in your very lungs. Every breath that you take is a blessing. <sighs> Blessed. That's life. That's a miracle. So live out that blessing every day. And thank you, God. Ephesians 6 verse 7 says, serve wholeheartedly. And you think, oh, that's serving the Lord. The context is a slave, who, which is wrong. Slavery is wrong. And Paul's writing to a slave saying, don't complain about slavery. I'm not condoning slavery. But if you're going to serve, serve in your slavery as if you're serving the Lord. You might be in a bad situation. Things might be going wrong. Your boss might be horrible. You might be an organic slave, which means you have to work even though you sign a contract and you agree to it. If you don't, you're going to starve. So you're organic. So you've got free range slaves, which is what most of us are in our jobs. <laughs> and God wants to bless you out of that. But you think that's an excuse to complain and say you don't like your job and you don't like this. And well, they didn't treat me right. So I'm going to try treat them bad. Well, are you managing the ground that God gave you to work? Or are you blessing, even though they curse you, are you blessing your boss? Are you working that ground so that God can bless your hands? I'm telling you, if you produce for whatever context you're in, let's say it's a horrible company with a horrible boss. If you produce, they would be stupid not to promote you. Pharaoh is not a lovely man in the Bible. Pharaoh did some evil stuff. They had sorcerers, sorcerers and bad things. You know what Joseph did? Interprets his dream. Saves all of Egypt. God blessed the work of his hand. Filled barns. Because Joseph was going to manage well. He was promoted in the prison. He's still in prison. Oh, God's going to promote me out of prison. Well, what happens if you're just promoted in prison? Are you going to throw a tantrum now? No. Work for your slave master. As for the Lord. Because he's going to bless the work of your hands. What other option do you have? Be a mere human? And just complain like everyone else can complain and get good at it. I'm not promoting slavery. I'm not promoting small thinking and just being stuck in a pattern. What I'm, what I'm saying is God will bless the work of your hands. Even if you're in the mud, work it well. And God will bless you. It's just good. These are good old-fashioned values. These are good biblical values. Values. It's not fancy. It's not magic. It's not like God's just going to come along and change everything, although he can and he does. But don't live waiting for magic. Live every day under the blessing of God. When you wake up on a Monday morning, pray for your boss. Pray for your wife, even though she's horrible to you and doesn't like you. <laughs> if you're single and you don't have a wife, just say, thank you, God, that I'm single. <laughs> I'm you, you hear the heart of what I'm saying? I'm not putting religion on anybody. I'm just saying, live under the blessing. Put your hands to something so God can bless it. You know, for many, many years, I have pursued entrepreneurial ventures. And I've pursued breaking out of patterns. Because I hate feeling restricted. I, I hate it. I hate it when people come and just touch my arm. My mother will touch my arm and I'm like, Get, I don't like it. I just feel restricted. I, <laughs> being honest now, I hate it when I'm in a room and someone's in the doorway. So I'm like, how do I get out? That's just who I, maybe I've got problems. Uh, well, I do definitely have problems. Everyone's got problems. But that's just who I am. But you know, unless you have some restriction and some boundaries and some pattern and some systems and rule sets and principles, how are you going to be able to produce anything? You think you can just plant and not harvest and put it in a, a barn and save some of it so you can replant for next year? And not eat everything that God's blessed you with? No, you've got to have a system in place. You can't just be, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. So as I've built businesses, I've seen, oh, people need boundaries. People need contracts. I hate contracts. I want to do a business deal on a handshake and a look in the eye. I trust you. The handshake is a sign of covenant. We should be swapping blood right now, but we don't do that since eights. But that's what I want to do. People don't operate like so. I go, I don't want contracts. I don't want contracts. I don't want contracts. Which is, everyone knows I'm stupid. I agree I'm stupid. But that's what I want to do. 
But God says, you need to be faithful with the ground that I've given you. And if that's the arena where people, other people operate by contracts, and if you don't have one, they're going to mess you up on the deal, sign the contract. <sighs> God, thank you. This is the ground you give me. Okay, put the contract together. I feel like I'm despising you by making you sign a contract. They go, hey, yeah, I'm happy to sign. I've got to do that. Put my big boy pants on. You know, if you're going to your job, it sounds so religious, but can you hear that I'm not trying to be religious? I'm really trying to give you a heart and an instinct of the key that God's given us for greater blessing. In, in reality, not in some like super spiritual world that the angels are going to come down and just open everything up for you, which I've got friends who do. You guys know people who have angels come down and do things. Amazing. It's wonderful. Not against any of that. I'd love more of that in my life. But that's just not an everyday occurrence for most of us. So let God bless the work of your hands. So if you're arriving at work on time, that's what mere humans do. If you're clocking out at one minute past five, are you giving everything that you could give to bless the work of your hands? You're just doing what everyone else does. I'm not saying be religious and say three hours extra. No, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying don't be on Facebook all day when your boss is paying you. Don't take 20-minute toilet breaks every three hours. Because <laughs> some people are trying to put in the minimum, right? They're trying to get away with what they can get away with. What I'm, the heart of what I'm saying is God has blessed your hands. So put your hands in the dirt, get stuck in, and allow him to bless you even more. And you know what will happen when you have that mentality is you will enjoy what you do to a much greater degree. Even if we just negate the blessing, let's pretend the blessing doesn't exist for a second. You will enjoy the process more. There's nothing worse than the customer coming in and going, oh, um, I have to serve you. Why not? Hey, welcome. Nice to meet you. What can I help you with today? Just forget about any benefit. Just that interaction. That person goes, wow, oh, man, where are you from? It's nice to meet you. And now you have a wonderful conversation. You never know. That person could offer you a job. You don't know. But this, what time is it? I need to leave now. Try it. Just try, just try this. If you don't like your job. Winnie, am I right? Winnie is very successful in the business world. Yes, you are. Yeah. <laughs> but you've seen many young people come and go, right? The ones that are successful, do they have good attitudes or bad attitudes? Altitude is the most important factor. Yeah. Amen. People with good attitudes get promoted. You can even have a poor skill set, but with a good attitude, you'll develop a skill set that you could get promoted in. Sean, you're talking about work. You're talking about, well, what about your marriage? What about having a good attitude in your marriage? Yeah, your husband's useless in areas. Yeah, he's forgetful. What about having a good attitude anyway? Because God will bless the work of your hands. And if you take your hands off, I'm hands off, I'm hands off. Well, God can't bless it now. Because he's going to bless where you put your hands. Say that for the, for the mic. Yeah. It, it starts with perspective. You can't just like grunt work your attitude. If you have a half empty perspective, you're just going to be bitter. But if you have a glass half full perspective, you're going to look for opportunities. Like, maybe there's a job at work that people are all hating on and no one wants to do. But um, maybe if you do it, you actually think, oh, wow, everybody's missing a solution. And if I work on this and find out all the knickknacks with it, then maybe I can make a business idea out of that solution. And then you, you get rich. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Richard Branson started Virgin Airlines because he got bad service from, I believe it was British Airways. And so in the airport, he was in music, not in, in airplanes, but he knew about customers. That's his big thing. And so in the airport, he put his hand up and said, anyone want to fly too? Let's charter a plane. And he chartered the plane because he treated his customers well. In the moment, he's on holiday. He started Virgin Airlines. 
And how many people have been on virgin planes? Because he just treated people well. He just had a good attitude. He didn't turn that occasion into a, a grumpy complaint session that everyone does. He turned it into an opportunity. Why? Because God blesses the work of your hands. He does not, compl- he does not bless your complaints. He does not bless your accurate uh, accusations of what's not working. He blesses the work of your hands. It's not always healthy to just call out what's wrong and just go, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Especially in a marriage. Not always healthy. Sometimes you just got to put your head down and work. Okay. Four objections to management. Uh, First one, earn and deserve. The second one is uh, um, magic. The third one is super spiritual. God's going to do it all. We've touched on that. Um, There was a rabbi who had a young student come to him and said, Rabbi, in the old days, God would speak so clearly and so obviously. But these modern days, it feels like God never speaks at all. And the rabbi gave a brilliant answer by saying, some people are looking so high in the clouds for what God's able to do. They're not willing to bow low enough to see what God is doing. God's working every day. There are miracles every day. The fact that we wake up (laughs) is a miracle. You could die in your sleep. It's a miracle. And sometimes we don't look at those things because we're too busy going, God, it's only up there and only when I see the big things am I going to manage my lot in life. No. Manage your horrible little job that you don't like. Manage your horrible little life that you think is so small and you can complain about. Manage, manage that well. Oh, I have to get a bus. What? You get to get a bus? These kids in Africa have to walk 4Ks. Don't get any buses. And the kid in Africa can't go, well, I don't get a bus. He goes, I get to walk 4Ks every day. That's why I'm not fat like Sean. <laughs> manage the ground that God's given you. And he will promote you and he will bless you in that. We're not spoiled little rich, rich Christian brats who just think we get everything because daddy won it all. No, he's going to bring you as a partner into the family business. He's going to give you keys to have access, not ownership. You don't get to own it all. The way we can prove that is on your deathbed when you die and they put you in that little wooden box or they burn your body, see how much you take with you. Nothing. Nothing. In Hong Kong, we burn paper cars and paper money and paper things, but it all gets burnt up. (laughs) You don't really get it. You don't take anything with you. You get to manage it for a while. Those zeros in your bank account, it's not your zeros. When you die, the government takes a lot of it. Hopefully your kids take some of it. You just ruled over it for a time. You don't own it. You don't own anything. Super spiritual. And the fourth one that I want to talk about today, the fourth objection to management. Let me look up in the heaven so no one takes this personally, but you all know what I'm talking about. The fourth objection to management is laziness. Lazy. I just don't want to. I just don't want to. You know, when you're tired, you can't have... There's just times you're just at your max and you need to just rest. You need to just stop and go, I can't do this right now. I need a rest. And you come back at it the next day. I'm not talking about healthy, good rest. You need to be resting once a week at least. Ideally, you need to have a little time and every day to rest. If you just go, 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 and then fill your downtime with a phone or Netflix, not healthy. You need to have some time for your brain to just process Just by itself, looking out a window, drinking a cup of coffee is brain dead. But you're not brain dead. You're processing. You need time every day to do that. But if you're doing that for 12 hours a day, and you're not on holiday, and you haven't just come out of the three-year project that you need two weeks to just do that. I'm talking about a lifestyle like that. Something's not right. That's called laziness. Let's bring up Proverbs. I love. Man, you've got to read Proverbs. It's so powerful. Try and read 
a little bit of Proverbs every day. Proverbs 10 verse 4. Lazy hands, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Now, we could use this in a religious fashion and beat anyone over the head, but say you've got to work, 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 work. Not meaning that. You've got to rest in his peace. But when it comes down to it, if your hands aren't in the ground, working what God's given you, you're lazy. Then you're going to be poor. The antidote to poverty is hunger. You get hungry, and then you go, um... Uh, maybe I need to work. Most people who are lazy will go, um, I need to work. Can you give me some money? <laughs> Let me just say to you, City Church, do not fall for scams. Do not fall, people, fall for people coming to you and asking you for things. If someone asks you for money, don't give them money. Give them an opportunity. Oh, you need something? Here, I have a car to clean. I have some paper to file. There's a job down the road that I can get you a, a opportunity yet. Don't go, here's cash. As a rule, every rule is made to be broken. You know, you know, you hear the heart of what I'm saying? As a general protection, don't fall for that. And if you're someone who's in need, don't ask for money. Ask for an opportunity. There's a, there's a, there's a pride. There's a healthy dignity in saying, hey man, I'm in a rough spot and we've all been in rough spots. I don't want to ask you for cash, but I need cash. Do you have a car I can clean? Do you have some paper? Do, can I send your emails? Do you, what can I do that would help you? Because now you're earning something and you're giving your hand to something that God can bless. Yeah. We had a person in the church a couple years ago. One Sunday would come in, broken person. Everyone at an instant would recognize broken, but you just see the way that they dressed, the way they carried themselves, the way they spoke. I'm not talking about like hurt broken. I'm talking about vicious, angry, bitter, scowling face, broken. We're all broken. But this was like a, oh, this, you could just feel this person was trouble. You know, just a problem waiting to happen. And so this person... On one Sunday afternoon, after a couple of weeks of playing the game of making connections, talking to people and pleading the case of how hard their life was and how difficult it was and had all the reasons and all the excuses, I can see a few people in the room shake, nodding their heads going, yeah, I remember who you're talking about. And one afternoon, went to, I think, eight different people and asked for money, all privately, all independently, all quietly, but asked for money. I think they cleaned out six or eight grand in one afternoon. And it was because city church people were generous. They could see this person's broken and they want to help. And so they were giving money. Now, I'm not against giving money. It's good to give money sometimes. But this person was using us. And so in the week, I had quite a few people come to me and say, Hey, Sean, this, this thing, are you sure? And I just heard, and actually that person also. And So what I did was I contacted this person. Firstly, I contacted everyone in city church of leadership. And I said, um, and this was, Rob was still leading, so this was under his guidance. I said, no one's to give anybody any money. We just put a pause on that. Just warn everyone, don't give money. We will help as a church, leadership in the church, we will help this person. So I called the person. I said, I know you're struggling. I know you need cash. I would like to give you cash. And so I told that person to come to Sai Kung which I knew was an hour and a half journey for them, but I wanted them to cross the threshold. I wanted them to invest. So they came all the way to Sai Kung at a time that was convenient for me. Now, I'm not usually like this. I'm usually generous and I try and help people, but I was putting blockades and barriers in the way of this person to see what are they willing to jump over? How desperate are they? Or are they just playing a game? So they came begrudgingly. They were 45 minutes late and... But you know what? You know, sometimes things happen and excuses are sometimes excuses and sometimes they're real. And so I took this person to uh, welcome to the shopping center. And we went through and I said, what do you like to eat? And they said, I like this and I like that. And I got them the treats that they were saying. And then I went into the rice aisle and I got a big bag of rice. Rice that would take you a month to get through. Put that in the trolley. And her eyes went wide open. 
She said, well, I, I can't carry that. I said, well, you said you were hungry, right? You said you had issues. Here's a solution. Oh, no, 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 well, then I have to cook that. I said, you don't have a kettle? You can't boil water for your rice? Oh, uh, well. I thought, oh, that's a little odd. Here, I'm paying for the next, like, rice by itself is not tasty, but it's sustenance. For the next month, you're going to be fed, and you're den- you don't want to do that. I went through a few loaves of bread. Oh, no, no, I don't like bread. I don't like bread. Well, what about noodles? I don't like noodles. And just started to get complaining. But they wanted the chips and the biscuits and all the nice snack food, but they didn't want real sustenance. Then I find out as we're paying, I don't really want any of this because I have to carry it. Can't you just give me cash? Now, I knew that she had six to eight a grand from the week previous. Like, why do you need more cash? Can, can you see? I'm, I'm just giving you insight into how some people who are users who are not willing to put their hand in the dirt and get blessed, they're going to use others how they think. So my friend in Ireland, he's very street smart. Street smart. He said to me, Sean, what you've got to do with people is you got to watch if there's any unusual behavior. So he gave me this example. I would never have thanked this myself. He said, if uh, you're, you're buying a car and the guy says, no, no, don't meet me at the garage. Meet me just down the road. He said, there's something dodgy going on. I wouldn't even think. I'd be like, yeah, sure, I'll make it convenient for you. He said, why aren't they meeting at the garage? Watch out for anything untoward. Someone phones you out of the blue, City Church, and says, hi, I really need, and I'm working for Jesus, and I'm a Christian organization. I really need money. Put them in touch with a leader. Put little tests in place to see is this real or not. Ask them for details. Don't just assume because someone puts a Jesus label on it that it's Jesus. Don't be gullible. Don't be gullible. Protect yourself. Put little... Anyway, to finish that long story, this person, very angry with me. I topped up her octopus card because she traveled. I made sure she had triple the cost of her journey and sat down with her to buy her lunch and bought her double what she would normally want because I said, take some home. Give it to your friends. I was being generous, but I wasn't going to give her cash. And she got so angry with me because it wasn't cash. And I realized, ah, this person's just using. So I drew a line in the sand. I said, no more. Never another penny was given to her from City Church, as far as I know. And the line was just drawn. Boop, finished. Not going to happen. A lazy pair of hands will bring poverty. And then poverty will try and use other people. Be diligent with your finances. Don't allow people to use you because they're lazy. Now, if someone has sick and they're broken and they don't know how to get i'm not being i'm not saying be horrible i'm saying be wise okay it's not a rule it's advice and if you don't know if someone says oh, please don't talk to anyone about this most of the time it's because they're playing games with several different groups and they don't want the lies to crisscross so what's usually healthy is if they say oh don't talk to anyone else about this I'm talking about like someone struggling with sin and they really need guidance and it's not a public i'm not talking about it. i'm talking about scams schemes say no no don't tell me then because i want to talk to other people about this just don't accept whatever they're about to say and it's very healthy to go to someone and say hey meiji what do you think i should do because this sounds weird and are you sure and if someone is wise and they give you good counsel they go no that's perfectly fine i understand this situation i know more than you know actually that'll be a nice thing or that smells weird yep okay um yeah don't don't be confused or or deceived if someone mentions jesus in a sentence not everyone who says jesus those (laughs) those nigerian emails Greetings, brother, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and blessings on you and your children, and we love your ministry, and it's all generic and spelling errors. <laughs> we, get, uh, we get maybe eight or ten of those a week. I don't even respond. Yeah, 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 all, all the time, because they just go through churches di- directories, and they just try and cut, cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste. You think if we believe Jesus, oh no, they want to do Bible for, Bibles for the poor, Hallelujah. Bibles are free on an app, and most people in Africa have more access to mobile phones than they do water. That means they have more access to the Word than they do water. Why do they need Bibles? Open your phone. Okay. Let's just bring up for for the heaven of it, uh, Proverbs 10 verse 5. He who gathers crops in the summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps during a harvest is a disgraceful son. 
there are sprints in life where you just need to put your head down and work. And if you do not harvest the crop within the small window that you've got, that crop goes bad and you can't harvest it. So people who want to have an equal work-life balance at all times don't understand seasons. Sometimes you just got to work and sleep and work and sleep. My dad always says, make hay whilst the sun shines. And some people get enough and then they go, that's enough. I'm not going to work anymore. And sometimes that can be the right thing. But I want to tell you, to be prudent, you need to have more than enough. You need to save for the rainy day. If you're not saving, you're not being diligent with what God's given you. You need to be saving. If you're earning just enough, it's not enough. If you're arriving just on time, you're not on time. Just good old-fashioned advice. Nothing fancy. Nothing super spurgeous. 80% of everyday life. Jesus. What are you going to tell your kid? Sit on a rock and wait for the clouds to open and the miracle will happen. Or are you going to tell your kid, get a good education, go to school, greet your teacher, thank them, write a thank you card, buy them a bottle of wine at the end of the year, get an internship, make sure you ask my friend for an opportunity to wash his car, learn how to wash cars. What, what are you going to say? Super spiritual? You're going to say practical. In the practicality of everyday life, make sure that whatever you produce is open to the supernatural. It is so wonderful. Because you, you, you know what will happen whilst you're cleaning that toilet bowl? You'll have an opportunity to minister to the broken person who's just had an abortion and their life is falling apart. And whilst you're scrubbing poo and that smell, you can witness Jesus. But so many people only want to wait to a stage on a Sunday morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And then they're just giving a bad witness on a Monday morning. I don't like cleaning this toilet bowl. And that person's broken and crying for godly wisdom. But you're complaining about the fact you have to work. He who sleeps during a harvest is a disgraceful son. Now God will never judge you. He will never call you disgraceful. He will never hate you. This is talking about in our earthly context. When you have the opportunity, make hay whilst the sun shines. And the last proverb there, verse 23, all in chapter 10. You can imagine what I was reading this week. Uh, a fool finds pleasure in wicked schemes. Get rich quick schemes. A little buy one, get one freeze, but you've got to sign up on this thing. And you can reject any time, but you've got to go on a Tuesday and you've got to go into the office and you're going to make a million dollars. It's just always attracted to the shortcuts. But a person of understanding delights in wisdom. Wisdom is not quick. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's the long way around. Sometimes it's rejecting the tempting offer that seems like it's going to solve all your problems instantly. The snake oil salesman and just goes, you know what? I'm going to stick with being diligent with the work of my hands because that's where God blesses me. There is no blessing in the get rich quick scheme. There's blessing where my hands go. That's why I don't gamble. I don't gamble because of any moral reasons. I don't gamble because God doesn't bless the gambling of my hands. He blesses the work of my hands. I'm not working when I'm gambling. So I don't gamble because that's not where the blessing is. And if you want to get super spiritual and God hates gambling, you're welcome to all of those reasons. But I'm a value person. I want to see where the value is. The value is with God. I'm going to invest with my hands. If I can't invest with my hands, it's probably a get rich quick scheme. It's a gamble. And the house always wins. Okay. Good old fashioned advice. Is that good? Okay. In closing, there are three are arenas. I'm just going to list them and give you a quick example. Not going to be long, I promise. Especially after last week. Three arenas you get to manage that, that God gives you ground to work. Three arenas. The first arena is time. Manage your time well. I am very bad at this. If it wasn't for Bonnie, I would be late for everything. I'm very bad at time. So put things in your calendar. Put buffers. If you have to arrive at 11.30, aim to arrive at 11. 
Stop using traffic as an, as an excuse. Do you, are you really surprised that Hong Kong has cars? Did cars happen yesterday? They didn't. Oh, Sunday. I know, I'm not trying to bully people, anybody to come to church, but I look at Sunday and people are late and I'm like, was it a surprise? So manage your time better. If you're always tired, manage your time better and put something in your calendar every day and then something regularly where you rest. Well, I can't afford it. You can't afford to look out a window or take a $5 bus to a mountaintop and sit there. Is that too expensive? Just let your brain rest. Manage your time better. Second dimension is your treasure. Mostly our finances. Manage your finances as well. Don't fall for the schemes, for the tricks, for the crypto scams. I fell for the crypto scams, some of them. Uh, make sure you can put your hands to something that God can bless. If your hand's not on it, it's not a guarantee that God's going to bless it. Manage your finances well. Are you in, can you handle a two-minute tidbit of ambiguity? I'm not going to give you an answer now. I'm going to give you a question because I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if tithing is a new covenant or not. I know good preachers who believe in tithing, and I know good preachers who don't believe in tithing. I'm not talking about arrogance and rebellion against God. I'm just talking about some people who go, tithing is not part of the new covenant. I don't know. I'll tell you this. I tithe, but I'm not sure if it's biblical in terms of the new covenant or not. But I heard Miles Monroe say this. I think he comes from an old covenant perspective, but I found this so interesting. So take everything I'm saying now with a pinch of salt. He said, tithing is an indication of whether you're managing your finances well. If you can't give 10% of your wealth to the one who already owns it, because you're just managing it, then that shows that the rest of your finances are in disarray. I thought that is the best argument for tithing I've heard. Because it's not super spiritual. It's about management. It's about what you have control over, what your hands are on. So if you can't take 10% out of your paycheck every month or week or whatever it is, you don't have enough, that means you're not managing well. Is that interesting? Now, do not quote me and say that Sean says, you, if you don't, I'm just giving you something interesting to mull over. You tithe out of faith and only out of faith. If you tithe because you're fearful God will punish you for not tithing, please don't tithe. Stop tithing, test God on it and go, God, I'm not sure if I should tithe enough, but I don't want to tithe out of fear because you're going to shut the heavens if I don't tithe. Stop tithing and wait till you're in a place of faith to tithe. And if you don't tithe, don't not tithe because well, I'm t I don't want to tithe and it's religion and it's control. Don't be stupid. Don't be rebellious. You only tithe because it's in faith, and you only not tithe because it's in faith. Faith is the only thing that pleases God. If you're doing something out of fear or out of rebellion, you're not in faith. Is that a good rule? You didn't hear me say, God will shut the heavens if you don't tithe. And you didn't hear me say, don't tithe. I don't know. I'm telling you I'm tithing anyway, because I believe in the local church. And I believe God wants to bless me beyond 10%. So I, I don't tithe because it's a tax. I tithe because it's a tribute. Because I go, look how much God has blessed me. And because he's blessed me, here's 10%. To show the principalities and powers where my allegiance lies. I do not tithe to get more from God. My tithe, in my opinion, my theology, is not a seed. It's a fruit. If you believe it's a seed, hallelujah, hallelujah, you do what you need to do in faith, as long as it's in faith. Okay, first dimension time, second dimension treasure, third dimension your talents. Whatever your skill set is, whatever God has given you in terms of gift and ability, manage that well. Get educated, learn, go and learn from someone who's further ahead. Ask questions. Don't let your talent sit there and do nothing with it. Manage it, invest into it, grow it, because that's where God can bless you the most. Everybody stand. Thank you, Father, for your blessing. We thank you that the mechanism by which you bless us is not magic, and it, it is not um, some mystery that we can't get hold of. Thank you, Lord, that the mechanism that you bless us is management, that wherever we put our hands, you will bless.
We thank you that we, own and, we don't uh, earn and deserve that blessing, that we get to receive that blessing by your grace. And Lord, in our lives, open our eyes by revelation to what you have already given us. Show us our patches and our territories and the boundary lines that you've given us. And help us, Lord, to become more aware that we get to partner with you in the kingdom to access the heavenly wealth that, wealth that we already own. Thank you, Father. I thank you for, for people's finances, that as they start to become more aware and conscious of their partnership by management, that those finances will improve, that problems will solve, that debt will dissipate, not by magic, but by management. Lord, I pray that you give people supernatural strategies to put their hands on the right things to get out of debt. Lord, more than that, I thank you that we, we, we would not be attracted or tricked into schemes that get us into debt. Thank you, Lord, for a godly wisdom in the area of finances. I pray for in the area of relationships that people wouldn't just throw up their hands and go, oh, I can't do this, I can't do this. God, it's your problem now. I pray that people would see that you have given us an ability to navigate relationships, that you have given us a strength to take abuse and bless others anyway. And in the long term, for those situations to be turned around. Thank you, Father. I pray for open calendars where people would start to see a greater yield on their time, that people wouldn't allow others to dictate their calendars and their appointments, but they would start to prioritize the things of the kingdom that are healthy and good, as well as entertainment, but they would prioritize that which yields the greatest result. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for enriched lives in terms of joy and company of good people around us. Lord, we pray for great meals of friendship, fellowship. We thank you for that joy, Lord. We thank you that our lives would not be dogmatic, boring, uh, just working, but that they would be full of your life. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Yeah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I just bless everybody in City Church, everyone in the room, and everyone listening online, that we'd come into a new dimension of God's management in your life. Bless you, City Church.